Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me today for another near-death experience interview today with Johnny Davis. This video will be part one of our interview where Johnny will share his near-death experience. And tomorrow I will share part two of our interview, which will be as usual, the Q&A portion. I know I've been saying this about every single interview lately, but this was once again, one of the most inspiring conversations that I've ever had with anybody. You'll understand why after I share a little bit about him. So Johnny Davis is an inspirational speaker, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and success coach. His book, I'm Still Here, From Heart Failure to Heart of a Champion, is a number one Amazon bestseller. He is also one of the 25 co-authors of the book, Cardiac Athletes, that can be purchased on Amazon. He is a heart failure and sudden cardiac arrest survivor with an inspiring story to share with the world. Rather than being overcome by fear over his condition, he has turned it around and used it to help other people. And he has this deep spirituality, which he combines with tools to help people with their mindset. He's been featured on Fox 46, Charlotte, WBTV, WCNC, Fox Soul TV with Tammy Mack, Spectrum New Channel 14 in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was recently on the cover of Health Monitor Magazine, June 2020 edition. He's a Rutgers University graduate, originally from Newark, New Jersey. He now resides in Charlotte, North Carolina with his beautiful wife, Rachel. I will have Johnny's website, www.succeedwithjd.com, as well as his Instagram and the link to his books in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Here's Johnny. Johnny, thank you so much for being with me today. I am so honored and excited to have this opportunity to speak to you and hear about your near-death experience and, and learn from you. Even as we were just talking off the recording, I've already been so inspired and challenged by your message and what you do in the world. So I'm really excited to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. So if you wouldn't mind, could you start by just sharing your near-death experience with us? Sure. So before I get to that part, I need to share what led up to it. Because, you know, just getting right into the near-death experience kind of just, you know, just takes the fun out of everything right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go so, for it. Yeah. So actually, I was, uh, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure at the age of 34 years old. This was back in 2006. And, you know, up to that point, I had never been sick like that in my life. I had never had any heart issues, never had any problems with diabetes or any blood issues. I've never been overweight. I've never used any illegal drugs a day in my life. And so when you think about the typical factors that would cause a person's heart to go into failure, I did not meet that criteria. And so when I was diagnosed with that, I was totally blown away. My doctors um, were not able to give me a definitive answer as to why it happened. And so my diagnosis was idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which is a fancy word for, we don't know why your heart is failing. And so um, I was seen by multiple cardiologists and that was just for me to figure out exactly what was happening, what was going on. And so until this very day, Still, that's the diagnosis, idiopathic cardiomyopathy. And um, so I went through this really terrible ordeal for a number of years, just dealing with this heart failure because it really put me in a situation where I was, I was tired all the time. I was, I was just physically unable to do all the things that I normally would do. I mean, just imagine you being a young person and you can do anything, you can go anywhere, you have the vitality and the energy and the strength to do whatever you wanna do. And then all of a sudden within less than a 30 day period, you go from that to being now in a situation where you need someone to take care of you. You're tired all the time. You're just basically kind of like confined to your couch or your bed and you, you need someone, you need care. You need a caregiver, so to speak. And that was a, a debilitating situation from a mental aspect as well, because not only was I physically tired and physically drained, and I just physically felt like giving up, but mentally as well, it just played on me. And so 
I found myself kind of like spiraling, spiraling into like a dark space. Uh, I wouldn't call it depression. I didn't, I don't think I reached that point yet, but I was definitely spiraling into that place. And so, uh, but fast forward, I was able to survive that. I connected with some really good people. I had some, some, some strong prayer warriors in my corner by way of my mom and you know, my, my church that I used to go to when I was in New Jersey and all of my friends that knew my situation and knew what was happening. And so I mustered up the, enough strength to kind of like get back into the, the swing of things. And, and so um, from 2006 to 2012, my heart function improved, but it never got back to full strength. And so even though it was not at full strength, I was functional. I was able to go back to the gym. I was able to start exercising again. I was able to resume doing my business and, and doing limited traveling and things of that nature. So I, I was kind of feeling like my normal self, even though physically I wasn't normal. I didn't have the strength I had before, but I said, well, this is going to be my new normal. So I'm gonna make the most out of it. And then 2012 arose, came by and um, now I'm married. Oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to tell you that. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Rachel. <laughs> and uh, we've actually actually been married now going on 11 years this November. And so we started off the year 2012 celebrating my 40th birthday. Okay, and this, this was our second year in marriage as well. And so life is fantastic, beautiful, heart functioning, okay. And um, I was looking forward to a bright future with my new wife. And, you know, we had so many plans and things that we were looking to do. We wanted to start a family, so on and so forth. And life was awesome. And then here comes November 2012. November 2012, I go to my cardiologist. And he shares with me that after I went there to get my echocardiogram results, he shared with me that my Ejection fraction had decreased. It went from 39% down to 25%. And I don't know if you are familiar with the, the term ejection fraction. Maybe yes. Hopefully your viewers are as well. Uh, but I was already in heart failure at 39%, but I was functional and I was asymptomatic. When I went to go back to him to get my echocardiogram results in that November, it decreased to 25%, but I was still asymptomatic. And so he tells me, he said, well, listen, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know exactly why your ejection fraction decreased, but it's at 25% and you need to have a defibrillator pacemaker implanted in your chest today. Because if you don't, there's going to be a tragedy in your household. He said, but we have a problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, your insurance company won't pay for it because you're only 40 years old and you're asymptomatic. So I said, well, what are my options? He said, well, you don't really have any other options. You need this device implanted in your chest today. Or, you know, like I said, you can, it's gonna be a tragedy in your household. You can go to sleep and never wake up. You can fall asleep at a red light and just slip away. He said, I've seen this happen at that time. He was a cardiologist for 13 years. So I've seen this for the past 13 years happen to people. And I don't wanna see this happen to you. And so I said, well, how much is it gonna cost me? He said, it's gonna cost you about the same amount of money as a luxury vehicle. And it's not, uh, and that doesn't include the hospital fees and the doctor's fees, that's just for the device itself. So you're looking at well over six wow. figures to have this device implanted in your chest and have this procedure done. And at that time, I didn't have an extra six figures it's just lying around in my bank account just for, you know, for heart surgery, especially when we have medical coverage. We had health insurance at the time. And so I went and got a second opinion from another cardiologist. And he said, yeah, you know what, we can maybe try, uh, try titrating your medication to see if that works, put you on a higher dosage on this particular med and see, and we'll monitor you over the course of the next 30 days to see what your heart is doing. Well, just as my previous cardiologist said, December 24th, Christmas Eve, 2012, I went into sudden cardiac arrest and I died. My heart stopped for over 16 minutes. I had no pulse, I had no oxygen to my brain for over 16 minutes. And they worked on me for over 
40 minutes or so, as I recall the EMTs telling me after we had our reunion later. Uh, but during that time, you know, my wife said I grabbed her and I shook her and she thought I was having a bad dream. And so she called my name, Johnny, wake up, wake up. And she noticed I didn't respond. And so she turned on the lights and saw that my eyes were rolling in the back of my head. And so she began to do chest compressions on me while I was lying in the bed. Now, you know, if you're doing chest compressions on anyone, they should be on a hard surface. But she's giving me chest compressions. I'm on the bed, you know, I'm 220 pounds at the time. So it's, it's not working. So she actually witnessed me take my last breath and die right in her hands. And so uh, the firemen came over and it was four of them. And each one of them did 300 chest compressions on me for a total of 1200 chest compressions. Uh, and I was shot six times with a defibrillator. And I started breathing on my own, but I never regained consciousness. And so I coded on the way to the hospital, I coded in the hospital. And basically they told my wife that the person that she knew before was not going to be, that there was so much time that elapsed without me having any oxygen to the brain that they were fearful that I was gonna be severely brain damaged. And so they told her that, you know, you need to be thinking about getting some help by way of a caregiver and things of that nature. Now, mind you, we had only been married just two years now, just two years. And I started off 2012 celebrating my 40th birthday, birthday, having a fantastic time. December of that year, fighting for my life. So life can just, it's so fragile and it can change in an instant, right? And that's what happened for us. And so um, that was the beginning of that. And I'm only able to tell you the story, Melissa, because it was told to me a thousand times, maybe 2000 times now by my wife. And there's other details of the story that she always shares because I was totally oblivious to anything and everything that was on, on this side of the plane. I don't have any recollection at all of what led up to it and what happened after. I have no recollection. There's blocks of my memory that were deleted, if you will. So, uh, and I think I thank God that I don't remember it because for my wife, it was such a um, traumatic experience for her. And even to this day, she still doesn't like to talk about it, even though now we're coming up on nine years removed from that. She still doesn't want to talk about it. She still doesn't do interviews. She refuses to even be brought back to that space because for her, she's anchored you know, by that. And it just automatically brings her to this, this place where she's just so hurt. Mm. My experience is totally different. I have no emotional attach attachment to it. So I can share and I can talk about it freely because it, it doesn't make me emotional at all to talk about it. Mm. Um, but what I will say about the whole experience of being disconnected from my body, I do recall as I was in a coma for two days and I spent nine days in the hospital or 10 days in the hospital total, um, I do recall me seeing myself lying down, but at the same time, I was, I was in a space where I was so, I felt so, so loved. And it was, it just enveloped me like a mother holding a newborn, like you, you're a mom, right? So you remember the first time you held your son or your daughter and you can just imagine the level of comfort that they felt in your arms, the safety and the security. That's how I felt. It was like a safety, it was like a security. And, and I just felt so peaceful. I was, I was everywhere all at once. Like my consciousness was just, was just heightened a thousand times. But the crazy thing is, is that I was not, I didn't, I didn't miss what was on the other side. It was like I was oblivious to what was on the other side. And my wife said to me that she was talking to me while I was lying in the, lying uh, on, the, on the hospital bed with all of these wires and tubes and everything going in me. And she was whispering in my ear, telling me that she loves me and come back and 
you're my champion. I love you. We want you here. We need you here. And I told her, I said, babe, I didn't hear a word you said. Like I was, I was not here, you know? Um, but I do recall just feeling like I was so loved. And then I heard a voice. That voice said to me, that is not your time. You can't stay. And I heard that voice just as vivid and just as clear as I can hear the own, my own sound of my voice right now as I'm speaking to you. I couldn't tell if it was a female's voice or a man's voice, it, but it was, it was loud, but it was also very soft. It was just like, you ever, you ever have a book in your hand and you're reading the book, but you're reading the book to yourself? You can hear yourself reading it, but you can't explain exactly, well, what does that voice actually sound like? You just know that it's a voice, right? Right. That's your spirit man yeah. talking. And so that's how it was for me. It was a very soft, subtle, but loud at the same time because it was a perfect silence, just perfect silence. And um, I remember feeling that I didn't want to, I didn't want to return. I didn't want to come back. I wanted to stay exactly where I was. Um, so I didn't see a light. Uh, I didn't see family members. Uh, things of that nature, but my, my experience was one of love, safety, um, pure happiness and joy, and I didn't want to return. I felt like I was in a really good place, and had I stayed a little longer, I would have been okay. I would have been gone for good, and my spirit would have been completely satisfied and, and happy. Um, overjoyed, if you will, with where I was at that time, because I was completely oblivious to anything that was happening on this side. There was, there was no emotional attachment to anything on this side. And I thought that was absolutely amazing mm -hmm. because, you know, when you, when you lose family members and friends, you often wonder if they're thinking about you, if they're watching you, if they're looking out for you. And in that brief moment, in that brief moment when I was disconnected, I was unaware. So I was still, I, I think I was in a place, I was still kind of transitioning. You know, that's, that's the only way that I can kind of make sense out of it and, and, and try to interpret exactly what was happening to me at that time. But it totally changed my life. And it totally changed my perspective on life. And, uh, you know, I've always been a reserved, calm, easygoing person, but it just made me that much more calm and that much more easygoing and um, that much more uh, appreciative, you know, and it also gave me a, a heightened sense of, of compassion uh, and a heightened sense of, of love and appreciation, especially during these times right now. When we're seeing so many people pass away from so many different things, you know, we're in the midst of a, of a pandemic. And um, if you're on social media, you can see all the rest in peace, rest in peace, this person, that person, this person. And it's just so much hurt and it's just so much pain, you know, that people are dealing with. And, um, and it's crazy, Melissa, because it's like, it's almost like I can feel that. It's, it's, it's weird and I, I can't explain it, but I, I had some, 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 I guess, supernatural things occurring when I did come back into my body and I was back in, back in, you know, this, this vessel. And um, I remember getting home and having these weird dreams. I mean, really bad dreams. Not well. Some of them were bad dreams, but some of them were, were, were I think, people that were coming to visit me. Because mm -hmm. um, I still kind of had a connection. I tell my wife, I had this connection between our world and the other world, you know, just beyond that there's a, there's a realm of our reality that is, is, is just beyond this wall. Like this is a wall, it's just beyond the wall. And I still had a connection there. And I still, I had people visiting me in my dream. And it's, it's really weird, you know, and I don't like talking about it to folks that are like not on this level, because when you're when you're having these types of conversations with people, 
that don't understand the supernatural or totally disregard the supernatural because you have a lot of scientists and people out here that are atheists that don't believe. And I don't get into arguments with those individuals. I don't try to force them to kind of see things my way. I'm like, you know, you definitely have the right to be wrong. I had people visiting me, you know, sharing different things with me that they wanted me to take back messages that they wanted me to convey to folks. Mm -hmm. And I, and I did that, you know, with a couple of my friends and it freaked them out and it freaked me out. But, you know, I was just like, man, this is, this is really, really just, it's unexplainable. I can't explain it. You know, there's, there's things that are just beyond our, our scope of understanding. And I, I, I've come to accept that, you know, I'm not one of those rigid scientists that says, oh, you, there has to be an explanation for it. Nope. Because scientifically, I'm not even supposed to be alive. I'm, I'm, I'm dead right now. According to medical science, Johnny Davis should have died on Christmas Eve nine years ago. But I'm here talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Johnny. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. 